I think this conversation we're going to have, I'm imagining it's going to be something like a a field guide to what technology is doing to the human mind. <laughs> I think we'll talk about how we can decide to move intentionally in that space of possibilities in a way that's healthier for, for all of us. And this is obviously something you're focused on, but to bring everyone up to speed, because even I was not up to speed until just a few days ago, what is your background? And I've heard you're, you've had some very interesting job titles at Google, perhaps among other places. One was the resident product philosopher uh, and design ethicist at Google. So how did Tristan Harris get to be Tristan Harris and, and what are you doing now? Well, first, thanks, thanks for having me, really. Uh, it's it's honor to be here. I'm a big fan of this podcast. Um, so yeah, my role at Google, that was an interesting uh, name. Uh, so design ethicist and product philosopher, I was really interested in essentially when a small number of people in the tech industry you know, influence how a billion people think every day without even knowing it. How, if you think about your role as a designer, how do you ethically steer a billion people's thoughts, framings, cognitive frames, behavioral choices, basically the schedule of people's lives. And so mm -hmm. much of what happens on a screen, uh, even though people feel as if they're making their own choices, will be determined by the design choices of the people at Apple and Google and Facebook. So we will talk, I'm sure, a lot more about that. I guess prior to that, when I was a kid, uh, I was a magician uh, very early. And so I was really interested in the limits of people's minds that they themselves don't see, because that's mm. what magic is all about, uh, that there really is a kind of um, band of attention or short-term memory or ways that people make meaning or causality that you can exploit as a magician. And that had me fascinated in, as, a, as a kid. And I did a few little magic shows. And then uh, flash forward when I was uh, at Stanford, I did computer science, but I also studied as part of a lab called the, B uh, the Persuasive Technology Lab with BJ Fogg, mm -hmm. which basically taught engineering students how this, this kind of library of persuasive techniques and habit formation techniques in order to build more engaging products, basically different ways of um, taking advantage of people's cognitive biases so that people fill out email forms, so that people come back to the product, so that people register a form, so that they fill out their LinkedIn profiles, so that they tag each other in photos. And I became aware um, when I was at Stanford doing all this that there was no conversation about the ethics of persuasion. Right. And just to ground how impactful that cohort was, in my year in that class in the Persuasive Technology Lab, the my project partners in that class and very close friends of mine were the founders of instagram uh and so and, and many other alumni of that year in 2006 actually went on to join the executive ranks at many companies we know linkedin and facebook uh, when they were just getting started and uh and again never before in history have such a small number of people with this tool set uh influenced how people think every day by explicitly using these persuasive techniques and so at google i just got very interested in uh how we do that yeah, and so you were studying computer science at Stanford? Originally computer science, uh, but I dabbled a ton in linguistics and actually symbolic systems. Yeah. Because you, oh, yeah. you was, were at Stanford eventually. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, that was a great major at Stanford. I, I was in the philosophy department. That, there was overlap between philosophy and computer science for yeah. symbolic systems. I think Reed Hoffman was one of the first symbolic systems majors at yeah. Stanford. Yeah. So yeah, so persuasion, is, is it, the connection to magic is interesting. There's, there's an inordinate number of magicians and fans of magic in the skeptical community as mm -hmm. well, perhaps somewhat due to the influence of James Randi. But mm -hmm. I mean, magic is really the ultimate act of persuasion. You're persuading people of the impossible. Mm -hmm. So you see a significant overlap between the, the kinds of hacks of people's attention that magicians rely on and our new persuasive technology. Yeah, I think, well, I think if you just abstract away what persuasion is, it's the ability to do things to people's minds that they themselves won't even see how that process took place. And I think mm -hmm. that parallels your work uh, in a big way in that beliefs do things. To have a belief shapes the subsequent experience of what you have. I mean, in fact, in magic, there's like principles where you, know, you kind of want to start bending reality and creating these aha moments so that uh, you can do a little hypnosis trick later, for example, that people be more likely to believe having gone through a few things that have kind of bent their reality into being more superstitious or more open. Mm -hmm. And there's there's just so many uh, ways of doing this that most people don't really recognize. I wrote an article called uh, How Technology Hijacks Your Mind that um, ended up going viral to about a million people, and it goes through a bunch of these different techniques. But uh, yeah, 
That's not something mm. people mostly think about. You also said in the setup for this interview that you have an interest in cults. Yeah. What's that about? And and to what degree have you looked at cults? Um, well, I, I, I find cults fascinating because they're kind of like vertically integrated, persuasive environments instead mm. of just persuading someone's behavior or being the design of a, a supermarket or the design of um, you know a technology product you are designing the social relationships the power dynamic between a person standing in front of a of, a, of an audience mm -hmm. you you can control many more of the variables and so uh, i've done a little bit of sort of undercover <laughs> investigation of some of these things you mean actually joining a cult or no not joining but uh showing I mean, up physically and, and many showing up physically many of these things are um none of these cults ever would call themselves cults i mean many of them are simply workshops sort of new mm -hmm. agey style workshops but you start seeing these parallels in the dynamics do you want to name any names do i know these groups? i might prefer not to at the okay. moment we'll see if we get there okay <laughs> You have a former girlfriend who's still in one? <laughs> no, no. But I, I did actually, one of the interesting things is the way that people that I met in those cults who eventually left and later talked about their experience and the confusion that you face. And I know this is an interest you've had. Uh, the confusion that you face uh, when you've gotten many benefits from a cult. Uh, right. you've, you've actually deprogrammed, let's say, early childhood traumas or identities that you didn't know you were holding or different ways of, uh, of seeing reality that, that they helped you, you know, get away from. And you get these incredible benefits and you feel more free, but then you also realize that was all part of this larger persuasive game to get you to spend a lot of money on classes or courses or these kinds of things. Right. And so what the confusion that I think people experience in knowing that they got all these benefits, but then also felt manipulated and they don't know in the sort of mind's natural black and white thinking how to reconcile those two facts. I actually think there's mm. something parallel there with technology because, for example, in my previous work on this, a lot of people expect you, if you're criticizing how technology is designed, that you, if you might say something like, oh, you're saying Facebook's bad, but look, I get all these benefits from Facebook. Look at all these great things it does for me. And it's because people's minds can't hold on to both the truth that uh, we do derive lots of value from Facebook and there's many manipulative design techniques uh, in, in across all these products that are not really on your team to help you live your life. Right. Um, and and that, that's, that distinction is very interesting when you start getting into what ethical persuasion is. Yeah, it is a bit of a paradox because you can get tremendous benefit from things that are either not well-intentioned or just objectively bad for you or, or not optimal. I mean, you know, the, the ultimate case is you, you hear from all of these people who you know, survived cancer, and cancer was the most important thing that ever happened to them. Right. So a train wreck can be good for you on some level, because your response to it can be good for you. Right. You can become stronger in all kinds of ways, even by being mistreated mm -hmm. by people. And so, but it seems to me that you can always argue that there's probably a better way right. to get those gains. Well, and this is, I mean, frankly, with your work on the moral landscape, you know, when, when you're thinking about, if you're a designer at Facebook or at, at Google, uh, because of how frequently people turn to their phone, you're essentially scheduling these little blocks of people's time. If you put, you know, if I, if I immediately notify you for um, every Snapchat message, which Snapchat is one of the most abusive, uh, more manipulative of, of the technology products, there, you know, when you see a message from a friend in that moment urgently, a lot that will cause a lot of people to go swipe over and, and not just see that message, but then get sucked into all the other stuff that they've been sort mm -hmm. of hiding for you, right? Uh, and that's all very deliberate. And so if you think of it as, let's say you're a designer at Google and you want to be ethical and you're steering people towards these different timelines, you're steering people towards schedule A in which these events will happen or schedule B in which these other events will happen. You know, back to your point, should I schedule something that you might find really challenging or difficult, but that later you'll feel is incredibly valuable? Uh, do I take into account the peak end effect where people mm -hmm. will have a peak of an experience and an end? Do I take a lot of their time or a little bit of their time? Should the goal be to minimize how much time people spend on the screen? Uh, what is the value of screen time? And what are people doing that's lasting and fulfilling? And when are you steering people as a designer towards choices that are more shallow or empty? So you're clearly concerned about time, as we all should be. It's, mm -hmm. it's the one non-renewable resource. It's the one, the one thing we can't possibly get back yep. any of, no matter what other resources we marshal. And it's clear that our technology, especially smartphone-based technology, is 
just a kind of bottomless sink of time and attention. I guess there's the other element that we're going to want to talk about, which is the consequence of bad information or superficial information and just what it's doing to yeah. our minds. I mean, the, the, the fake news phenomenon being of topical interest, but just the quality of what we're paying attention to is crucial. But the, the automaticity of this process, the addictiveness of this process, the fact that we're being hooked and we're not aware of, the, of how calculated this exactly. intrusion into our lives is. This is the thing that's missing, is that people don't realize, because there's this, the most common narrative, I mean, we hear this all the time, that technology is neutral, and it's just up to us to choose how we want to use it. And if mm -hmm. it happens, if people do fake news, or if people start uh, wasting all their time, that that's just people's responsibility. What this misses is that because of the attention economy, uh, which is every basically business, whether it's a meditation app or the New York Times or uh, Facebook or Netflix or YouTube, you're all competing for attention. The way you win is by getting someone's attention and by getting it again tomorrow and by extending it for as long as possible. So it becomes this arms race for getting attention. And the best way to get attention is to know how people's minds work so that you can basically push some buttons and get them to not just come, but then to stay as long as possible. So there are design techniques uh, like making a, a product more like a slot machine uh, that has a variable schedule reward. So, you know, for example, I know you use Twitter. Mm. You know, when you land on Twitter, notice that there's that extra variable uh, time delay between like one and three seconds before that little number shows up. You have a return and the page loads. And there's this extra delay. I haven't noticed that. Yeah. Hold your breath. And then there's a little number that shows up for the notifications. Mm -hmm. And that delay is, is makes it like a slot machine. You're literally, when you load the page, you, you're as if you're pulling a lever and you're waiting. You don't know how many there's going to be. Is there going to be 500 because some big tweet storm? Or is there going to be Does, Doesn't one? it always say 99? Uh, well, you're, not everyone is Sam Harrison okay. has so many. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, I mean isn't, isn't that always the maximum? It never says 500, right? It, uh, you know, I, so I don't, because again, I'm not you. Yeah, I don't okay. have as many followers. No, I, well, um, I think I can attest that I mean, mine is always at 99, so it's no longer salient to me. Well, right, which actually speaks to how addictive variable rewards work, which is the point is it has to be a variable reward. Mm -hmm. So the idea that I push a lever or pull a lever and sometimes I get, you know, two and sometimes I get nothing and sometimes I get, you know, 20. And this is the same thing with email. Well, let's talk about what is the interest of the company, because I, I think most people are only dimly aware. I mean, they're certainly aware that these companies make money off of ads very often. They sell your data. So your, your attention is their resource. Yep. But take an example. I mean, so something like Twitter can't, seemingly can't figure out how to make money yet, but Facebook doesn't have that problem. Well, let's take the clearest case. Mm -hmm. What is Facebook's interest in you as a user? Well, obviously, the, there's, other, there's many sources of revenue, but it all comes down to, um, uh, whether it's data or everything else, it comes down to advertising and time. Because of the link that more of your attention or more of your time equals more money, uh, they have an infinite appetite in getting more of your time. So time on your newsfeed and this is, is literally is how what the they metrics, want. Yeah. That's right. And this is literally how the metrics and the dashboards look. I mean, they measure what is the current uh, sort of distribution of time on site. Time on site is the uh, that and seven day actives are the currency of the tech industry. And so right. the only other industry that measures users that way is sort of drug dealers, right? Where you have the number of active users who, lo who log in every single day. Um, so that combined with time on site are the, the key principal metrics. And the whole goal is to maximize time on site. So Netflix wants to maximize how much time you spend there. YouTube wants to maximize time on site. They recently celebrated people watching more than a billion hours uh, a month. And mm -hmm. that was a goal. And not because there's anyone who's evil or who uh, you know, wants to steal people's time, but because of the business model of advertising, there is uh, simply no limit on how much attention that they would like from people. Well, they must be concerned about the rate at which you click through to their ads, or are they not? They can be concerned about that, but because, um, and ad rates are, are depreciating, but because they can make money just by simply showing you the thing, and there is some link between mm. showing it to you and you clicking, um, you can imagine with more and more targeted things that you are seeing things that, that are profitable. Uh, and there's always going to be someone willing to pay for that space. Uh, but this problem means that as this starts to saturate, because we only have so much time, to even hold on to your position in the attention economy, what do you do? You have to ratchet up how persuasive you are. So here's a concrete example. Uh, if you're YouTube, uh, you need to add autoplay the next video. 
right. to YouTube. Yeah. Didn't you see that within the last year? I always find that incredibly annoying. Yep. I wonder what percentage of people find that annoying. I mean, is it conceivable that that is still a good business decision for them, even if 99% of people hate that feature? Well, it's it's with the whole exit voice or loyalty. If people don't find it so annoying that they're going to stop using YouTube, because the defense, of course, is yeah, there's no way they're going to stop using YouTube. So of course not. And yeah. that's what these these companies often hide behind this notion that if you don't like it, you can stop using the product. But while they're saying that, I mean, they have teams of thousands of engineers whose job is to deploy these techniques I learned at the Persuasive Technology Lab to get you to spend as much time as possible. Um, but just with that one example, let's say YouTube adds uh, autoplay the next video. So they just add that feature. And let's say that increases um, your average watch time on the site every day by 5%. So now they're eating up 5% more of this limited attention market share. Mm. So now Facebook's sitting there saying, well, shoot, we can't let this go you know, to dry. So we've got to actually add autoplay videos to our newsfeed. So instead of waiting for you to scroll and then click play on the video, they automatically play the video. They didn't yeah. always used to do that. Yes, yeah, another feature I hate. Yep. And the reason, though, that they're doing that, what people miss about this is it's not by accident. The, the web and, and all of these tools will continue to evolve to be more engaging and to take more time because that is the business model. And so you mm -hmm. end up in this arms race for essentially who's a better magician, who's a better persuader, who knows these back doors in people's minds as a way of getting people to spend more time. Now, do you see this as intrinsically linked to the advertising model of revenue, or would this also be a problem? if it was a subscription model? It's a, it's a problem in both cases, but advertising exacerbates the problem. So you're actually right that, um, for example, Netflix also maximizes uh, time on site. Uh, what I heard from someone through some back channels was that uh, the reason they have to do this is they found that if they don't maximize, because for example, they have this auto countdown watching mm -hmm. the next episode, right? right? So they yeah. don't have to do that. Why are yeah. they doing that? Strangely, I like that feature. Yeah. Try to figure that out psychologists among you. Well, and this is, this is where it gets down to what is ethical persuasion, because let's, that's a one persuasive transaction where they are persuading you mm -hmm. to watch the next video. Yeah. But in that case, you're happy about it. I guess the reason why I'm happy about it there is that it is, at least nine times out of ten, it is, by definition, something I want to watch because it's in the same series as the series I'm already watching, right? Whereas YouTube is showing me just some random thing yep. that they think is analogous to the thing I just watched. And then when you're talking about Facebook, or I guess I've seen this feature on on embeds in news stories like on in the atlantic or vanity fair the moment you bring the video into the frame of the browser it'll start playing mm -hmm. i just find that annoying especially if, if your goal is to read the text rather than watch the video yep but again there's this because of the game theory of it when one news website evolves that strategy you can think of these as kind of organisms that are mutating new persuasive strategies that either work or not at holding on to people's attention and so you have some neutral playing field and one guy mutates this strategy of on the news website of auto-playing that video when you land. Let's say it's CNN. So now the other news websites, if they want to compete with that, they have to, and assuming that CNN has enough market share that that, that makes a, a difference, the other ones have to start trending in that direction. And this is why the internet has, has moved from being this neutral feeling resource where you're kind of just accessing things to feeling like there's this gravitational wormhole suck kind mm -hmm. of quality that pulls you in. And this is what I think is so important. You asked, you know, how much of this is due to advertising and how much of it is due to the hyper competition for attention um it, it's it's both uh one is we have to be able to decouple the link between how much attention uh we get from you and how much money we make and we actually did the same thing with um you know for example in uh, in energy markets where it used to be the energy companies made more money the more energy you use mm -hmm. and so therefore they have an incentive they want you to please leave the lights on please leave the faucet on we are happy we're making so much more money that way but of course, that was a perverse incentive, and so this new uh, regulatory uh, commission got established that that um, basically decoupled. It was called decoupling. It decoupled the link between how much how much energy you use and how much energy they how much money they make. Well, and there's some ads online that I can't even figure out how they're working or why they're there. They're they're these horrible ads at the bottom of even the most reputable websites like the Atlantic. You'll have these ads. I think usually they're framed with, you know, from around the web, mm. and it'll be an ad like, you won't believe what these child celebrities That's, look like today. Yeah, uh, yeah Tabula and Outbrain, there's a whole actual kind of 
market of companies that specifically provide these related links at the bottom of news websites. But that, I mean, they're so tawdry and awful. I mean, so you can go from just, you know, reading literally the best long form journalism and hit just one garish ad after another. But the, the thing that mystifies me is when you click through to these things, I can't see that it ever lands at a product that anyone who was reading that article would conceivably buy. I mean, you're just going down the sinkhole into yep. something horrible. Everything looks like a scam. It's just... It all comes down to money, though. The reason why... So I actually know a lot about this because the company... The way I arrived at Google was they bought our little uh, startup company for our talent. And we didn't do what this, this sort of market of websites did, mm -hmm. but we were almost being pushed by publishers who used our technology to do that. Uh, so one of the reasons I'm so sensitive to this time on site stuff is because I had a little company called Apture, which provided uh, little in-depth background pieces of information without making you leave news websites. So you'd be on The Economist and it would talk about uh, Sam Harris and you'd say, who's Sam Harris? You'd highlight it and we'd give you sort of a multimedia background or thing and you could interactively explore and go deeper. And the reason we sold this, the reason why Economist wanted it on their website is because it increased time on site. And so I was left in this dilemma where the thing that I got up to do in the morning as a founder was, let's try to help people understand things and learn about things. But then the actual metric was, is this increasing our time on site or not? And publishers would push us to either increase revenue or increase time on site. And so the reason that The Economist and all these other even reputable websites have these bucket of links at the bottom is because they actually make more money from Taboola and Outbrain and a few others. Now, time on site seems somewhat insidious as a standard, except if you imagine that the content is intrinsically good. Now, now I'm someone who's slowly but surely building a meditation app, right? Mm -hmm. So now right. time on my app will be time spent practicing meditation. And so insofar as I think that's an intrinsically good thing for someone to be doing. Yep. Anything I do in the design of the app so as to make that more attractive to do, and, and in the best case, mm -hmm. irresistible to do, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the truth is, I would like an app in my life that got me to do something that is occasionally hard to do, but I know is worth doing and, and good for me to do, right. rather than waste my time on Twitter. Something like meditation, something like exercise, eating more wisely. I don't know how that mm -hmm. can be measured in terms of time, but th there are certain kinds of manipulations, speaking personally, of, of my mind that I would happily sign up for. Right? right. So how do you think about that? Absolutely. So that this is a great example. So because of the attention economy constantly ratcheting up these persuasive tricks, um, the price of entry for, say, a new meditation app is you're going to have to try and find a way to sweeten that front door so that that, is, that competes with the other front doors that are on someone's screen at the moment when they wake up in the morning. And of course, you know, as much as I, you know, and I think many of us don't like to do this, it's like the Twitter and the Facebook and the email ones are just so compelling first thing in the morning, even if that's not what we'd like to be doing. And so it, because all of these different apps are neutrally competing on the same playing field for morning attention and not a specific kind of like helping Sam wake up best in the morning, uh, for your meditation app and what many meditation apps I personally know, they, they have to provide these usually these notifications. So they start mm -hmm. realizing, oh, shoot, Facebook and Twitter are notifying people first thing in the morning to get their attention. So if we're going to stand a chance to get in the game, we have to start notifying people. Right. And then everyone starts, again, amping up in the arms race and you don't end up with, it's this race, classic race to the bottom. Uh, you don't end up with a, you know, a screen you want to wake up to in the morning at all. It's not good for anybody. But it all became, came from this, um, uh, this need to basically get there first to race up. And so wouldn't we want to change the, you know, the structure of what you're competing for so it's not just attention at all cost? So yeah, so you have called for what I think you've called a, a Hippocratic oath for software designers. You know, first, do no harm. What do you think designers should be doing differently now? Well, I think of it less as the Hippocratic oath. That's the thing that got captured in the Atlantic article. But a, a different way to think about it is that the attention economy is like this city, you know, essentially Apple and Google and Facebook are the urban planners of this city that a billion people live inside of. And um, we all live inside of it, like all, a billion people live inside of this attention city. And in that city, it's designed entirely for commerce. It's maximizing basically attention at all costs. And that was fine when we first got started. But now 
um, this is a city that people live inside of. I mean, the amount of time people spend on their phone, they wake up with them, they go to sleep with them, they check them 150 times a day. That's actually a real figure too, right? 150 yeah. times a day is a real figure for yeah. sure. Yeah. And so now what we'd, what we'd want to do is organize that city, almost like uh, you know, Jane Jacobs created this sort of liv livable cities movement and said, you know, there, there are things that make a great city great. There are things that make a city livable. Uh, you know, she pointed out eyes on the street, you know, stoops in New York. Uh, she was talking about Greenwich Village. These are things that make a neighborhood feel different, feel more homey, livable, safe. Uh, these are values that people have about what makes a good urban planned city. There is no set of values to design this city for attention. So far, it's been this Wild West, let each app compete on the same playing field to get attention at all costs. So when you ask me, what would what should app designers do? I'm saying it's actually a deeper thing. That's like saying, what should the casinos who are all building stuff in the city do differently? Right. If a casino's there and the only way for it to even be there is to do all the same manipulative stuff that the other casinos are doing, it's going to go out of business if it doesn't do that. So the better question to ask is, how would we reorganize the city by talking to the urban planners, by talking to Apple, Google, and Facebook to change the basic design? So let's say there are zones. And one of the zones in the attention economy city would be the morning habits zone. Mm. So now you just get things competing for what's the best way to help people wake up in the morning, which could also include the phone being off, right? That could be mm. part of how the phone, the option of the phone being off for a period of time and telling your friends that you're not up until 10 in the morning or whatever could be one of the things competing for the morning part of your life in the life zone there. Uh, and th that would be a better strategy than trying to change you know, meditation app designers to take a Hippocratic oath to be more responsible when the whole game is just not set up for them to succeed. Well, to come back to that question, because it, it's of personal interest to me, because I, I do want to design this app in a way that seems ethically impeccable. Mm -hmm. If the thing you're directing people to is something that you think is intrinsically good, and I mean, forget about all the competition for mind share that yep. exists that you spoke about, it's just hard to do anyway. I mean, people are reluctant to do it. That's why right. I think an app would be valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think the existing apps are valuable. So if you think that any time on app is time well spent, which I don't think Facebook can say, and I don't think Twitter can say, but I think Headspace can say that. Mm -hmm. You know, whether or not that's true, you know, someone else can decide. But I think without any sense of personal hypocrisy, I think they feel that if you're using their app more, that's good for you, mm -hmm. right? Because I think that it's intrinsically good to meditate. And I'm sure any exercise app, you know, or the health app or whatever it is, I'm sure that they all feel the same way about that. And they're, they're probably right. Take that case and then let's move on to a case where everyone's motives are, are more mercenary and where time on the app means more money for the, the company, which mm -hmm. isn't necessarily the case for some other apps. When time on the app is intrinsically good, why not try to get people's attention any way you can? Right. Well, so this is where the question of metrics is really important because um, in an ideal world, the thing that each app would be measuring would align with the thing that each person using the app actually wants. So time well spent would mean, in the case of meditation app, asking the user, I mean, just not saying the app would do this, but if you were to think about it, a user would say, okay, in my life, what would be time well spent for me? in the morning, waking up. And then imagine that whatever the answer to that question is should be the rankings in the app store, rewarding the apps that are best at that. Um, so that again is more the, the, the systemic answer that the systems like the app stores and the uh, ranking functions that, that run say search, Google search or Facebook newsfeed would wanna sort things by what helps people the most, not what's got the most uh, time. And the measure of that would be the evaluation of the user? I mean, the, 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 some questionnaire-based rating? Like, yeah. Is this working for you? Uh, yeah, and in fact, we've, we've done some initial work with this. Actually, there's an app called Moment on iOS. So Moment uh, tracks uh, how much time you spend in different apps. Uh, you send it a screenshot of your battery page on the iPhone, and it just captures all that data. And we've mm. actually, they partnered with uh, Time Well Spent to ask people which apps do you find are most time well spent, you're most happy about the time you spent, when you can finally see this is all the time you spent in it, and which apps do you most regret. 
And we have the data back that people regret the time that they spend in Facebook, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, and WeChat the most. Mm -hmm. And they tend, so far, the current rankings uh, are, for the most, are like My Fitness Pal and podcasts. And there's a bunch of other ones that I forgot. The irony is that being ranked first in regret is probably as accurate a measure as any of the success of your app. Yeah, exactly. Well, and this is why the economy isn't ranking things or aligning things with what we actually want. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it as everything is a choice architecture and you're sitting there as a human being worth picking from a menu and currently the menu sorts things by what gets the most downloads, the most sales, the most gets most talked about. The mm. things that most manipulate your mind. So the whole economy has become this, if you assume marketing is as persuasive as it is in a bigger level, the economy reflects what's best at manipulating people's psychology, not what's actually best in terms of delivered benefits in people's lives. And so if you think about this as, as a deeper systemic thing about if you would want, how would you want the economy to work? Um, you'd, you'd want it to rank things so that the easiest thing to reach for would be the things that people found to be most time well spent in their lives. Would it, for whatever category of life choice that they're making at that moment, in terms of making choices right. easier or hard, because you can't escape, you know, in every single moment, there is a, a menu, and some choices are easy to make, and some choices are hard to make. Seems to me you run into a problem which behavioral economists know quite well, and this is something that Danny Kahneman has spoken a lot about, that there's a difference between the experiencing self moment to moment and the remembered self. So when you're giving someone a questionnaire, asking them whether their time on all these apps and websites was well spent, you are talking to, to the, the remembered self. self. And Danny and I once argued about this, how to reconcile the, these two different testimonies. But at minimum, you can say that they're reliably different. So that if you, you were experienced sampling people along the way, you know, for every 100 minutes on Facebook, yep. every 10 minutes, you were saying, how happy are you right now? you would get one measure if at the end of the day you ask them how good a use of your time was that to be on Facebook for 100 minutes, you would get a different measure. Yep. Sometimes they're the same, but they're very often different. And the question is who to trust? Where are the data that you're going to use to assess whether people are spending their time well? Well, I mean, the problem right now is that the, all of the metrics just relate to the current present self version, right? Um, everything is only measuring what gets most clicked or mm. what gets most shared. So back to fake news, just because something is shared the most doesn't mean it's the most true. Just because something gets clicked the most doesn't mean it's the best. Just because something is talked about the most doesn't mean that it's real or true, right? right. The second that Facebook took away its human editorial team for the Facebook trends. Yeah. Um, and the, and they, they fired that whole team. And so it's just an AI picking what the most popular news stories are. Within 24 hours, it was gamed and the top story was a false story about Megyn Kelly and Fox News. And so right now, if getting into AI about all of these topics, um, AIs essentially have a pair of eyes or, or sensors that are trying to pick from these impulsive or, or immediate signals and it doesn't have a way of being in the loop or in conversation with our more reflective selves. It can only talk to our present in the moment selves. And so you can imagine some kind of weird dystopian future where the entire world is only listening to your present in the moment feelings and thoughts, which are easily gameable by mm. persuasion. Although it just is a question how to reconcile the difference between being pleasantly engaged moment by moment in a activity at the end of which you will say, I kind of regret spending my time that way. There are certain things that are captivating where you, you're hooked for a reason, right? Yeah. You know, whether it's a video game or whether you're eating French fries or popcorn or something that is just perfectly salted so that you just can't stop, you're binging on something because in that moment it feels good. And then retrospectively, very often you regret that use of time. Well, so one frame of this is this sort of shallow versus deep sense. That's what you're getting at here, is yep. the sense of something can either be full but empty, which we don't have really words in the English language for this, or something can be full and fulfilling. Things can be full very, very, very yeah. engaging or pleasurable, but not fulfilling. Yeah. Yes, and it, even more specifically, regretted. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the set of choices that you can make for a timeline. If you're, again, scheduling someone else's life for them, as people at Google and Facebook do every day, you know, where the, you can schedule a choice that is full and fulfilling. 
Now, does that mean that we should never put choices on the menu that are full, but you regret? Like, should we never do that for mm. Google or for Facebook? That's one frame, but let me actually flip it around and make it, I think, even more philosophically interesting. Let's say that in the future, YouTube is even better at knowing exactly what at every bone in your body you've been meaning to watch, like the professor or lecture that you've been told was like the best lecture in the world, or just think about what every bone in your body tells you, it in fact, would be full and fulfilling for you. And let's imagine this future DeepMind-powered version of YouTube is actually putting those perfect choices next on the menu. So now it's auto-playing the perfect next thing that is also full and fulfilling. Right. There's still something about the way the screen is steering your choices that are not about being in alignment with the life you want to live because it's not in alignment with the time dimension now. So now it's sort of blowing open or blowing past boundaries. You have to bring your own boundaries. Right. You have to resist the perfect. You have to resist the perfect. Yeah. Now, should that be... And but by the way, because of this arms race, that is where we're trend, trending to. People don't understand this. The whole point of attention, the attention economy, because of this need to maximize attention, that's where YouTube will be in the future. And so wouldn't you instead say, I want Netflix's goal to basically optimize for whatever is time well spent for me, which might be, let's say for me, watching one really good movie a week that I've been really meaning to watch. And that's because I'm defining that. It's in conversation with me about what I reflectively mm. would say is time well spent. And it's not trying to just say you should maximize as much as possible. And for that relationship to work, the economy would have to be an economy of loyal relationships, meaning I would have to recognize as a consumer that even though I only watch you know, one movie a week, that's enough to justify my relationship with Netflix. Because they found in this case that uh, if they don't maximize time on site, people actually end up canceling their subscription over time. And so that's why they're, they're still trapped in the same right. race. Right. And what concerns you most in this space? Is it social media more than anything else? Or is everything that's grabbing attention engaged in the same arms race and, and kind of of equal concern to you? Well, what, you know, it's, as a systems person, it's, it's really the system, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the attention economy. It's the race for attention itself that concerns me. Because one is people are, in the tech industry, appear to me very often... Uh, as being blind to what that race costs us. You know, if, if one, let's, I mean, for example, the fake news stuff, let, instead of going to fake news, let's call it fake sensationalism. You know, the newsfeed is trying to figure out what people click the most. And if one news site evolves the strategy of outrage, outrage is a way better persuasive strategy at getting you to click mm -hmm. if it generates outrage. Right. And so the newsfeed, without even having any person at the top of it, any captain of the ship, saying, oh, I know it's going to be really good for people is outrage, or that'll get us more attention. It just discovers this as an invisible trait that starts showing up in the AI. So it starts steering people towards news stories that generate outrage. And that's literally where like, the news feeds have gone in the yeah, last that's where we are. three months. This is yeah. where we are. True or fake, it's an right. outrage machine. Yeah. And, and then the question is, how much is that outrage? I mean, there's, if you thought about it, in the world... Is there any lack of things that would generate outrage? I mean, there's an infinite supply yeah. of news today, yeah. and there was even 10 years ago, that would generate outrage. Right. And if we had the perfect AI 10 years ago, we could have also delivered you a, a day full of outrage. And so... Uh, that's a funny title. <laughs> a day Just, full of outrage. Yeah, how easy to, would that be to market? A day full of outrage. <laughs> Nobody thinks they want that, but we're all acting like that's exactly what we want. Well, and I think this is where the language gets interesting, because when we talk about what we want, we, we talk about what we click. But in the moment, right before you click, I mean, I'm kind of a meditator too. Mm -hmm. It's like, I notice that what's going on for me right before I click is not, as you know from free will, like, how much is that a conscious choice? What's really going on phenomenologically in that moment right before the click? None of your conscious choices are conscious choices. Right. You're the last to know why you're doing the thing you're about to do, and you're very often misinformed about it. We can set up experiments where you'll reliably do the thing for reasons that you, when you're forced to articulate them, are completely wrong about. Absolutely. And even moreover, people, again, when they're about to click on something, don't realize there's a thousand people on the other side of the screen whose job it was, was to get you to click on that. Because yeah. that's what Facebook and Snapchat and YouTube are all for. So it's not even a neutral moment. Do you think that fact alone? would change people's behavior if you could make that transparent? It just seems it would be instructive for most people to see the full stream of causes that engineered mm -hmm. that moment for them. 
Well, one thing I've got some friends in San Francisco who are talking about this that uh, people don't realize, and especially when you start applying some kind of normativity and saying, you know, the newsfeed's really not good, we need to rank it a different way. And they say, whoa, 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 who are you to say what's good for people? And I always say this is status quo bias. People are thinking that somehow the current thing we have is set up to be best for people. It's not. Yes. It's best for engagement. If you were to give it a name, if Google has page rank, Facebook is engagement rank. Now let's just, let's say let's take it all the way to, all the way to the end. Let's say you could switch modes as a user, and you could actually switch Facebook to uh, addiction rank. The, fa the Facebook actually has a version of newsfeed that I'm sure it could deploy called, you know, let's just actually tweak the, the variables so that whatever. Uh, let's show people the things that will addict them the most. Or we have outrage rank, which will show you the things that will outrage you the most. Mm -hmm. Or we have NPR rank, which actually shows you the most boring, long comment threads where you have like these, you know, long, in-depth conversations that your, your whole newsfeed is these long, deep, threaded conversations. Mm -hmm. Or you could have the Bill O'Reilly mode where you get these, as a, something I know you care about, these sort of attack dog style comment threads where people are yelling at each other. You can imagine yeah. that the newsfeed could be ranked in any one of these ways. Actually, this this form of of choice is already implemented on Flickr, where you, when you look for images, you can choose relevant or interesting, or yep. so you could have that same drop down menu for any of these other media. And this is this is your point of like people don't see transparently what the goals of the designers who put that choice in front of you are. Right. So. The first thing would be to reveal that there is a goal. It's not a neutral product. It's not just something for you to use. You can obviously, with enough effort, get you know use Facebook for all sorts of things. But the point is the default sort of compass or or north star on the GPS that is Facebook of steering your life is not steering your life towards, hey, help me have the dinner party you know that I want to right. have, or help me uh, get together with my friends uh, on Tuesday, or help me make sure I'm not feeling lonely uh, on a, on a Tuesday night. There is. It seems to me a necessary kind of paternalism here that we just have to accept because it seems true that we were living in a world where no one or virtually no one would consciously choose the outrage tab. Right. Right. Like uh, basically, I want to be as outraged as possible today. <laughs> Show me everything in my news feed that's going to piss me off. Nor the addiction tab. Yeah. Nor the superficial uses of attention tab. You know, just cat videos. Yeah. All or day it's long. just give me the Kardashians all day long and. I'll regret it later. So no one would choose that, and yet we are effectively choosing that by virtue of what proves to be clickable in the attention economy. In service of the greater goal of advertising, again, like right. that goal wasn't by accident. In fact, in some ways it, it was, because I think sometimes what's so interesting when you talk to the people who make the products, of course there's no one there who says, I want to take you or steer you away from the life choices that you want to make. No one thinks that way. Um, the narrative, of course, at Facebook is that we're helping make the world more open and connected. And of course, it's hard to argue with that because it does do that, too. The problem is that's not what the thing that they're measuring every day is. Right. And also, what would that mean? What would be the values or the measurable outcomes or the teleological frames that you'd be choosing for? I mean, instead, imagine a time well spent rank, which would be basically a life rank. Like, what do you want most in your life? And instead of having those thousand engineers working to get me to scroll or click on the next thing... Uh, those thousand engineers would be basically working to help me schedule the next moments of my time in ways that I would find take me closer to the life that I want to live. Mm -hmm. You keep using this phrase, time well spent. That is a both a website and a, a foundation you started? or Yeah, so it's a uh, nonprofit movement um, that uh, I, when I left Google and my work as the design ethicist there, um, I realized that there was this fundamental conflict of interest, that the attention economies maximization of time spent was just never going to go away. And so if you want to change that, that core currency of success, you have to go outside. It's kind of like what the organic food movement was, right? Where before organic food, it was just uh, a race to the bottom to provide the cheapest lettuce on the shelf. And it's whoever can put the cheapest lettuce. Mm -hmm. And then someone figures out we can put cheap lettuce on there. We can get even cheaper lettuce by using this pesticide. And no one's discovered the pesticide yet. So that farmer starts to win. And it isn't until we have this new standard or this sort of movement that says we, we want organic food, we want a different kind of lettuce. Yeah. Um, so you need that or something like that, some kind of intervention like that to gradually change the success metrics. And so we call that time well spent just because it encapsulates the distinction between time spent today. So to, to use that analogy, the differentiator there is a person's willingness to pay for something that's harder to grow, harder to provide. Mm -hmm. 
So they're willing to pay more than what you have to pay for the cheapest possible lettuce. Right. What differentiates time stolen or squandered from time well spent in the marketplace? Just imagine five years from now, we have solved all of these problems. Mm -hmm. Our technology is as good for us as possible. Yeah, good question. How did we get there? What have we changed? So what it would take is, there's different questions about how you'd get there, whether it's regulation or it's enlightened uh, founders of big technology companies choosing to rank suddenly everything differently. But you can imagine a world where Apple and Google recognize that the current designs invisibly of the smartphones are to maximize, let's say, the time people spend in all the apps. And that instead of maximizing for that, and instead of just wanting every app developer to be successful at all costs, they say, we are going to uh, reorganize home screens and notifications and app stores to rank success in terms of how time well spent people found these things to be for that part of their life. So news media is ranked on uh, the, whatever you would call it, the epistemological credibility or the uh, tr you know, truth-seeking or, I mean, that, again, there's a bunch of different values that would be in that category. Morning habits and meditation apps would be ranked by uh, whatever people find helps them wake up best in the morning. Um, things would be ranked by the thing that matters for that category. Although it seems to me you're asking a lot of people to keep telling you whether things are working for them. Because yeah. with a click, they've told you without taking any time to tell you. They're not aware of having answered a questionnaire, but the way they're using their attention is giving everyone the information of you know whether this stuff is hookable in the way that the status quo now demands. In your world, we need people to assess the effects of their uses of attention and report back. But what are you actually picturing? How, how do people give the information back to the system so that these rankings reflect time well spent? So here's a concrete example. So let's imagine in the future, and I totally hear this concern, by the way, that do you want a world where everything is constantly asking you for a rating every single day mm. uh, for all of these things? Uh, and the answer is no, obviously. The question would be, from a time well spent angle, that time is the finite resource to manage. What amount of ratings would we want from people? But let's make it concrete. So let's say your phone, uh, you know, once a week basically shows you this reflection uh, of the biggest sort of surface areas of your phone's footprint in your life. So let's show, let's say that it shows you this mirror of saying, "Hey, Sam, this is how I see you waking up in the morning. Here's what." a morning for you looks like i have the data <laughs> it's right here on the phone yeah. um it's stored locally not in the server <laughs> and uh and it says hey look you know i noticed that you wake up you usually spend about 20 minutes uh surfing twitter uh you're in your email for about 15 minutes and then you get stuck in the apple news app for about 30 minutes and so you've got about an hour and 15 minutes before you're kind of Whatever, yeah. doing the and we thing. notice you haven't moved from we, your supine you position you yet. Let's even call it the uh, the sort of like uh, bed zone yeah. part of the reflection. <laughs> yeah. You haven't even gotten up. Um, which, by the way, again, back to persuasion. If if you could persuade someone just to lie down while they're doing all this stuff, you've actually are inherently changed the choice architecture. They're more likely to stay in the inertia of lying down than if you had stood them up. Like just we know from designing right. physical space. Okay, so we have this moment where where we we see. Um, you know, in your reflection that you've got this hour and 15 minutes that approximately is split between these different apps. And the phone says, is that what's time well spent for you in the morning? Like, what would be time well spent for you? And you would say, actually, not these things at all. And say, great, what would, what would it look like instead? And you'd say, hey, I want to meditate with my, my friends two, two days a week. And it says, great, who else meditates? And, and it would be directly linked into your app. And it'd basically say, when you and this other person wake up in the morning around the same time, do you want to opt into some kind of mode? So when you wake up, it shows you that if they also woke up around that time and you could swipe over and you know, you're in a meditation experience with mm -hmm. them. And so now your meditation app wins on the basis of how well it actually helps people in that morning, not how well it can just hijack and throw a notification in or create the bottomless bowl or do these other kind of persuasive techniques. Right. And so that's an example where the phone is asking you for reflection at an infrequent enough basis that it doesn't feel taxing. Let's say it's once a month even. And then it reorganizes the choice architecture of the home screen to be uh, most aligned with empowering you to make those choices. But again, now you're talking at the level of the city. This is not what any one app does. This Correct. is what Apple this does. This is what Apple and Google. And this is why, yeah. frankly, you, you need Apple and Google to make these changes. Or anyone who makes the platform, whether it's virtual reality or augmented reality or an ear 
earpiece, there, in general, there's going to be these choice architectures that we need those mm -hmm. platform makers, the urban planners, to be, to be thinking about it this way. Yeah, I want to talk about virtual reality and other technology, but to get my bearings here, do you think mostly in terms of mobile or is the, is the web just as much? Mm, I, I'm concerned with both because just the total time people spend on a screen every day is enormous and it obviously takes place increasingly on mobile. The thing about mobile is it's just the most ubiquitous. So it's the thing that affects everyone, no matter what sort of socioeconomic background you have. Do you know how the time is split between mobile and the web? I don't off the top of my head, but huh. um, you know, obviously there's, there's people, knowledge workers who spend a third of their day in email at a desktop and there's, there's this wide range. I, the question is just, you know, for each one of these core screens, how well is the choice architecture aligned with what people want? So now, what do you think is coming? What do you think virtual reality will do to us? And do we get new concerns there or just the same concerns, but more pressing? How well, one interesting thing about virtual reality is uh, if you were to rate a medium in terms of how persuasive it is. Um, so there's sort of a upper bound on how persuasive your mobile phone is, mm. right? It can't convince you of a new belief system, uh, right? Uh, but actually virtual reality can. Um, it's been shown that you know, in, in, in looking at this whole problem through a lens of persuasive technology, you're always concerned with what are the dimensions of persuasion? Can I just persuade people's beliefs? Can I persuade people's attitudes? Can I persuade people's identity to think of themselves differently? Uh, and one thing that's been shown, uh, this guy Jeremy Balinson at Stanford, um, is that a bunch of experiments on this that uh, you can have someone in virtual reality cut down a tree uh, and to feel like the haptic feedback of this thing jogging in your hands back and forth. Mm -hmm. And that, that actually changes your uh, relationship to uh, paper, like to basically wasting paper. Um, you can do some other things where people are embodied as like a, their opposite gender. And they experience something like, a, not sexual assault, but some kind of, or an opposite race or opposite ethnic background. And they experience some kind of embodied feeling or experience of, of someone looking at them a certain way. In, in that mode, and it changes their feelings about what those policy issues might be later mm -hmm. in the world. And so VR is really interesting because it's the most persuasive medium uh, that, we, that we have. And the problem, though, is that people tend to think about you know, the future of technology as this being kind of an uncertain thing, that we don't know what's going to happen. It's like a grassy field. And it's, it's not that, because the attention economy will still create this race for who's better at seducing your attention and keeping your attention and holding on to it, which means that things that are more like porn or more like the candy crushes of the VR realm will probably outcompete other things in that mm -hmm. realm. And the other stuff will exist, but it'll be niche. And so what I would say is like, this is the opportunity now before those things come to be, say, you know, if we had a different philosophical lens on what uh, uh, rankings we would want the virtual reality app store to have, we'd want to rank things in terms of uh, what persuades people in a positive way or what is time well spent for them. It's interesting because it, on some level, what we're talking about isn't new at all. I mean, we're, people were wasting time 2000 years ago, presumably, when you look at how the, you know, the people like the Buddha talked about the use of a human life and uh, the obstacles, in this case, to practicing meditation enough so as to have a good experience doing it or to, you know, the, the obstacles to becoming a truly ethical person, it was the same dynamic of doing things that you will later regret, doing things that you will discover were not as gratifying as they seemed, and they were never going to be as gratifying as they seemed. And if you could have had a, a wiser view, a top-level view of the situation, you would have agreed to cancel some of those opportunities to squander your time in advance, right. because however captivating they are, it is just more soft drinks or candy or porn. But then I or, push back and say, so yeah. Sam, you're running Google. Who are you to say that what the things we should put on the menu are and what stuff we should leave out? Because well, we have to put some default choices on the menu. For right, people. right. Yeah, so, but, so it's this ancient problem, except what we have now are technologies that can not only exploit our bugs to the, if not the maximal degree, to certainly to a new degree where we can be manipulated by others to waste our time. But we can actually design technologies that will change not only what we wind up doing, but what we want to do. Yep. The fundamental question is, like, what, what sort of person do you want to be? And yep. what sort of life do you want to live? And what's, what sort of life will you want to have lived? When you're on your deathbed, looking back, how much regret will you have? 
we know the answer to this question. How much regret do you want to have? Everyone's answer is none, right? right. Or as little as possible. And it won't change the fact that they'll go for the donut or, you know, go for the exhilarating experience. Cass Sunstein has a great line about this that, you know, just because there are these things people regret later doesn't mean life should be, in his words, long, dry, and chocolate-free. Right. You know, yeah. that there is a value. Some of our peak experiences in life are these sort of um, impulsive moments, but there is a question of boundedness or frequency. Like, do you want that all the time? Do you want the default choices to always be set that way? You really get this raising kids because you, you're constantly in the position as a parent of doling out empty pleasures or even unhealthy pleasures to your kids you know, as sparingly as is commensurate with your philosophy on these things. So whatever it is, ice cream. Do you have ice cream every day? No, right? But ice cream is a treat and it's fun and you don't want to live a life without ice cream, as far as I can tell. So you're, in, in a conservative way, exploiting your child's really bottomless capacity for joy around certain things which shouldn't, in the end, be the focus of life. You don't want a kid that, when he or she becomes an adult, has no way to console herself or himself but to go for a tub of ice cream. You don't want to figure out how to engineer that problem for them, but you still want a life with ice cream. And everything is like that on some level. And the problem is the new ice cream could be just the, the number of likes that someone has. I mean, I, I can convince, as so many teenagers are, they've been convinced that their self-worth or their popularity yeah. is the number of likes that they have. Yeah, or mo Minecraft. I, mean, I have an eight-year-old daughter mm. who's now obsessed with Minecraft, and I can't even figure out whether Minecraft is good, neutral, or bad for her. People with strong opinions on that, tell me what, what you think about Minecraft. It's captivating to a degree that worries me, right? It's like, if I said, listen, you know what, you can just do as much Minecraft as you want, she would just disappear into right. virtual space and never come out again. Does she use Snapchat? Or no, no that, okay. nothing, nothing, nothing like, like that, that yet. Yeah. Yeah. We will be late adopters of all of that. But yeah, I can see that, yeah, the social aspect to this, and, and yeah. I mean, the social, social media, it seems to me, brings at least two levels of concern that don't exist in these Either areas where, yeah, where we're just squandering our time. And the worst case scenario is for an, you know, an individual siloed app or website, you're just misusing your time and you'll yeah. regret it. But with social media, you are, this again connects to the fake news problem, you are very likely consuming misinformation that is manipulating you, and this is bad not only for you, but for society. And then you have this other level of, of your sense of self-worth yeah. being leveraged yeah. and in many cases destroyed and at an early age in ways that can be difficult to recover from by your interaction with friends and strangers in this space. Well, this is, this is where it relates to cults, right? Because cults partially manipulate you by orchestrating your sense of in the social realm as well, right? Mm. Just like we were talking about Facebook ranking before, you could imagine a uh, jealousy rank, which is a ranking of newsfeed or Instagram that is optimized to make you the most jealous of everybody else or to feel the worst about yourself. Like that, that's, yeah. that's just a mode you could create. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've written about this, but you know, there's these, we have not just this list of individual cognitive biases, but we also have these social psychological biases. We really care about others' approval. So think of the moment where people post a new profile photo on Facebook. That's a moment where you're putting your whole sort of self-identity on the line. It's yeah. like my new photo. And so knowing this, I don't know if Facebook does this, but knowing this, oh my God, I would just say, I, this is an easiest opportunity to exploit people's sense of self-worth. So what I'm going to do is time delay how often I notify you of new likes. So over the period of three days, I'll keep showing it to other friends strategically over the course of three days because then they'll start to like it more. And then I, caring about who's seen my, who's liked my new thing, uh, will we'll fall back into the, 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 the loop, right? So that's, that would be one way of hijacking people's attention again by mm -hmm. controlling their sense of identity. Uh, and Snaps, I don't know how much you follow Snaps chat, but uh, they have this feature called Snapstreaks, which is, I think, really manipulative. Do you know Snapstreaks? No, I, I never use Snapchat, so. Um, I mean, I, I don't either, but they added this thing called Snapstreaks, which shows you the number of days in a row that you have sent a message with someone. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, people who oh, use so it you, actively, uh -huh. yeah, it's like it's like a, in the meditation app, you'd have the same. Right, but no, but I, I see the implications here where if, if you, well, there, there's, there, there's a reciprocity issue when you're exactly. communicating with someone. 
And, yeah. the, and the thing is that as Snapchat, you can manufacture reciprocity. You can know that that person over there is vulnerable to needing to reciprocate. Mm. Let's, let's say you have a person that you know their psychology specifically, they have to say uh, thank you back when someone says thank you to them. So you can just make sure that they see thank yous everywhere. Or Facebook, frankly, does this with the happy birthday thing. Right. Where they can sort of orchestrate someone into saying happy birthday to someone else. So the other person has to come back into Facebook and respond. And this is actually how LinkedIn works, where they say, we're going to suggest to Sam that right after our conversation that he adds Tristan on LinkedIn, because I'll know that I'll feel compelled to come back to you. And, and again, this is like a cult. It's like you don't just control these individual biases. You, you can orchestrate people's whole social psychological biases without them knowing it. So we've spoken a little bit about what designers of the city should do, what whether they will do any of these things and over what time frame that's certainly an open question what should our listeners do in light of the fact that nothing will get done today to help them marshal their attention in a way that they will not regret well um i mean there i try not to get into the productivity hacks game i mean i do know a lot about that that space i think the biggest thing is to change culturally the perception that technology is neutral when we use, just when we're using this stuff, we have to recognize that there's a thousand engineers on the other side of the screen whose goal in designing the way I'm looking at this screen now was not to empower me most to make the life choices of my time that I want to make, but empowering me to spend time on the screen. Knowing that you will be able to spot some of these different techniques more easily because you can start to become aware of, you know, what, what actually is, am I being steered to do in any given moment? Now, that's actually not a pleasant way to live. Um, and, and that's why I think we, we actually need a new conversation about persuasion because we don't want to sit there in a world that's increasingly going to get better and better at persuading us and then be forced to sort of notice all these steering mechanisms in our lives and feel taxed and vigilant all the time. An ideal would be to be able to only deploy conscious energy when, for, the, for, the places, for, the, for the choices that matter. And to not be forced to kind of steer away from the from the donuts. You can imagine an adversarial persuader who puts donuts in your, uh, you know, right next to your bedside table, right when you wake up. And that would, you know, you could say, well, what's the big deal there? Because you could simply choose to avoid not to you know, choose it. But of course, we just know that, that would be disempowering, and we have to mm -hmm. we have to expend some amount of conscious energy. This is the Roy Baumeister stuff uh, on willpower. There's some amount of energy that it takes to resist this stuff when it shows up. Yeah. And, and we don't want a world where, as we're navigating to Facebook or something else, we have to constantly say, okay, shit, they're going to you know, try to get me to do something else than this one task I wanted to do of looking up a contact or uh, finding out where that event is tonight. And so the whole idea behind like a sort of a time well spent world is that things are designed so that they're aligned with you. I mean, the biggest thing about ethical persuasion is that the goals of the persuader are aligned with the goals of the persuadee. Persuasion is in most cases neutral. I mean, you we want to be persuaded to do things which we will feel constituted time well spent, right? Mm -hmm. So if there are 10 things on the menu, which I really want to get done, want to immerse myself in, there's no possibility that I will re regret doing any of them. Mm -hmm. And two of them are readily captivating, which is to say that there's basically no friction in me that's impeding my paying attention to those things. But the other eight are on some level a matter of my eating my vegetables as opposed to the ice cream. I want to be persuaded to do those things. Right. Right. So we're not trying to get rid of persuasion. We just we want some wisdom in the system. Yep. We want to be able to tell the system what it should be persuading us to do. Right. And it, let's imagine if we're playing the AI game here and we're trying to just imagine that we're training the AI to be hyper intelligent persuaders. Let's imagine you even give the AI an encyclopedia of every magician cult technique that in the book. So it's, it's literally we have an AI that can persuade you to do anything. Thought experiment. That sounds, we would then really care about what does it mean for that AI to persuade you ethically or for the good? Right. And to do that, it could say, well, look, it's, causing, it's persuading you to click on this thing and you seem to keep clicking on it. So you keep reinforcing it. That must be good. But clearly there is still something missing in that signal that the clicks weren't enough. Yeah. And so it has to be, I mean, in the AI, the AI community, they call us the human in the loop uh, computing, where they keep the human in the loop of, uh, say, the automatically self-driving car or something like that. This is essentially a reflective self-in-the-loop kind of persuasion. I care, just like I said with the, the 
phone example, it cares about what is time well spent for you in the morning. And it reflects that back to you and says, how is this going? And it only does that for the things that are meaningfully important in your life that it actually matters to do that reflection. Mm -hmm. But part of ethical persuasion, I think, is, is actually caring and, and helping the other person reflect on whether they're getting kind of what they, what they came for. It's interesting, though, that there is a disconnection between what people will say they want and what they actually want that drives through all of this. And so your, your analogy to self-driving cars reminded me of this fact that if you ask people, if you're driving down the street and you're going to hit a group of school children or you can drive off a cliff, speaking generically, they think the car should probably drive off a cliff, but nobody wants to be in that car. People will have to get better at choosing from the menu, yeah. even in their most reflective moments. Well, people have to have values. I mean, yeah. per your point earlier about, I think, you know, children, I think that the dangerous thing, and it's happened with consumerism, is where their values, the business's values, became our values. Which is successful advertising. That is successful advertising. Yeah. They generated, now you desire or want the thing that they got you to want. Right. Now, again, what's so bad about that if on reflection you feel happy about that? That's one thing, but there's still another thing, which is when you realize that someone manipulated you into doing that, into wanting that, and you weren't even aware that that was happening, people sometimes have a different point of view about whether or not they feel good about that. And this mm. is the cult thing, right? Yeah. This is, I was manipulated into an experience that then made me more free on the other end. And I feel really good about that. But then on retrospect, I feel like, whoa, I had no, they were manipulating me that entire time. Yeah, and well, suddenly people have a different, and in culty programming, showing people how they were manipulated uh, is one of the most powerful ways to help people uh, get out of the programming that they were. Well, I guess it, it, on some level, transparency of intention is crucial there insofar as the relationship with other people is important. So if someone's trying to get you to do something and you understand their motives, yeah. right? That you understand, one, that they're actually trying to get you to do something, and two, you know why, and your why is actually their why, well, then, then that's, there's no problem, right? right. Then, then it's a completely consensual situation. You're not going to feel manipulated, but you could feel pressured. You could feel, you could feel a lot of things. You, you have a, a very hard-charging performance coach who is trying to get you to change, and it could be uncomfortable, but... Right, they could yell at you, they, yeah. could, they could know that you're traumatized by this particular form of confrontation, so they use that form of confrontation that might be harsh, right, but, but you're happy about it on the other end. Yeah, and you, but, and you understand what you signed up for. Right. What gets interesting and seemingly demeaning when there's this mismatch between what you think is going on and what is actually going on in the other person's head. Not, and it does matter if it's personalized. If it's just an algorithm... Right. That, in fact, is a black box that no one understands, but it's just designed to maximize clicks in the universe. That's one thing. But if you have people who are, you know, twirling their mustaches. Well, how much have you followed, like, the Cambridge Analytica type stories about political advertising and automated political advertising? A little bit, just in the, you know, what's happened in this with the Trump phenomenon. Yeah, so there's a lot of controversy over whether Cambridge Analytica specifically was so effective as it was claimed to be in the election. But it really doesn't matter. Uh, what we're talking about is that there, there are metaphorically um, things that are very good at using personalized persuasive targeting to persuade you about, I mean, the famous example in their deck was if you're the kind of person who values tradition and authority and kind of old school values and uh, you're male, it would show you a, a sunset picture of a, of a grandfather and a boy with a gun saying, you know, this is just like the homeland when we used to go hunting or something mm -hmm. like that. And then if it's uh, instead, you know, uh, sort of a libertarian, um, you know, woman uh, in Kansas or something like that who really values the Second Amendment, they'll put a thing of a Obama uh, trying to grab your gun or something like that. And knowing what I would know about your specific psychology, I could persuade you towards a particular attitude or belief. And if you just imagine that that exists and it's very effective and that Facebook 100 million times a second runs this auction, it's got Sam's eyeball, and it's basically saying, who's going to pay me the most to persuade Sam? And it doesn't care whether your intention is nefarious or you uh, want to help Sam or you're trying to sell him some shoes. 
it can't make this distinction. We don't have language in English for uh, these subtle versions, these subtle distinctions in persuasion. What is the difference between manipulate, coerce, seduce, drive, steer? Uh, there is no vocabulary. And so this is what I actually think is, is most important. And I think your work is so related to this is how do we come up with the language of persuasion where when we have an increasingly persuasive world, it's one that we actually want to live in. And the biggest thing is that the goals of the persuader are aligned with the goals of the persuadee. 